yes, yes. Every time I see that intro, it's so oh, neat. that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> eagle. Who did the eagle? Oh my God. Um, I got it on Fiverr. Uh, I when I was running for Senate, I uh, I was like, I need an image a moving image of me in armor riding an eagle in flight wearing armor <laughs> and i posted it on fiverr and it was like it just to see what i would get and that's what i was like i'll spend 50 bucks on that that's awesome yeah yep. you that's the best 50 dollars you ever spent it literally is it literally <laughs> is hey everybody welcome to this week's edition of generally irritable uh, I am super excited and pleased to have my friend Dan French joining me this evening. It was pointed out to me that the uh, Vermont Secretary of Education is also named Daniel French. Really? Uh, yes. And I had people actually reach out to me and ask me how I was able, to, like, how'd you get him on the program? And I was like, who? What do you mean? He's an old what? friend of mine. You know, we go way back. He like named my business, all this stuff. And they're like, oh, but wait, where, where is he? And I was like, Austin. And they were like, I thought he was the secretary of education. It was really funny. It was a very confusing funny. conversation. The only other famous Daniel French, uh, the guy who, uh, the sculptor for the Abraham Lincoln Memorial. Oh, with him sitting, Daniel French. Shut up. Yeah. You're not named after said famous sculptor, are you? Uh, no, no. My middle name is Granite, though. <laughs> Shut up. No, it's not. No, it's not. Don't make jokes like that, Dan. You know that I'm gullible. Uh, well, it's part of the fun. <laughs> so I asked Dan here today, as you guys might be recognizing, this is a little bit different than a lot of the other programs that I've had on that are focused on local politics and specifically legislation or things that are going on at Burlington City Council or in Montpelier. And I invited Dan on this evening because as part of what I try to do here, you know, the goal, the mission of Generally Irritable is to help facilitate an engaged and informed electorate. And one of the things that is so hard and what I found why people don't want to engage is because of the tenor of the conversations that we're having. So whether it's, you know, arguing with grandpa at the dinner table, whether it's, uh, you know, I've had people reach out to me who've said, oh, I would run for city council, but I'm afraid for my business. Or I would get involved, but I'm afraid because of X, Y, or Z. I don't want to be attacked. I don't want to be harassed. Uh, you know, people have concerns. And I thought to myself, what better Hold on. It looks like this broadcast was deleted on Facebook to stream to Facebook, create a new broadcast or just remove this destination from the broadcast and re add it. Do we need to restart? Hold on. Let me see. It's not coming on. Okay. Hold on, Dan. We're going to have to try this again. Okay. I don't know what happened, but. Is there, okay. oh, I can check it online. What's the, is it just your website? It's on YouTube and Facebook. So it's not on Facebook. Let's see if it's on YouTube. I wonder why. Because it's a problem. That's why. That's stupid. Um just wants to be a problem yeah it's gonna make us start over again i think all right Am, are we on youtube can you tell uh what's your address on youtube generally irritable trying to see if we can just get it to start again, but it doesn't look like it wants to do it. There's a picture of you pointing at me on YouTube. Describe that action. 
It does say live. Let's see. Hmm. Let's see if this is working. We're on YouTube. Oh, hold on. Okay, now it's working. Okay, so we're live on YouTube. We just got it going on Facebook. So it's just being stupid. Well, you guys missed a really good introduction, those of you watching on Facebook and those of you on YouTube. Thank you for being patient while we figure out the technical issues. Look at that. Benjamin, if you're watching, did you see that? I figured out the technology all by myself. Did you? Did you, though? Didn't you just sort of look at it and wait for it to start? No, I had to go in and edit it and then remove Facebook and then add it back again. And it worked. Wow. Good. Good for you. That's more than I could have done. I'm really impressed with myself right now. I'm not going to yeah. lie. <laughs> All right. So for the benefit of those who are just joining us, I will. Okay, there we go. Watch live video. So let's see. So for those of you who are just joining us, I have Dan French as my guest. No, not the Vermont Education Secretary, Dan French, my friend and mentor uh, from Austin, Texas. Actually, you're not, you're from, are you, you're from Kentucky originally, aren't yeah, you? Yeah, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. That's right. Oh my goodness. You're a Southerner. A that is not my, that is not my thing. Is, is Kentucky considered the South? Uh, the Secretary of State of North Carolina, Rufus Edmondson. Okay. Once heckled me while I was doing stand up and called me a Yankee when he heard I was from Kentucky because Kentucky was neutral in the Civil War. Oh, so therefore, that's interesting. Okay, so you're not a Southerner. Well, it depends on who you ask. The state is half Southern, half Midwestern. I think and that's cool. where you're from. Yeah. Midwestern? Yeah, because it's right on the border with Indiana and Ohio. and you Oh, know. yeah. Okay. That makes sense, so, I guess. Anyway, state. so the purpose and mission of Generally Irritable is to help facilitate an engaged and informed electorate. So this is the part that you guys missed, why Dan is on the show today. So as I said, normally we've got, you know, local politicians or things like that. We're talking about local politics. And I asked Dan on today because of the... In, uh, engaged electorate part of that mission and facilitate an engaged and informed electorate. And there are so many people that I talk to who say that they would get involved in politics, that they would run for office, that they would do something if it weren't for the tenor of the conversation about politics. People are afraid for their business. People are afraid, you know, for their kids that are in school and things like that. And one of the things Dan is really, really good at, given that he does have a doctorate in rhetoric. Did you guys rhetoric. know that was a thing? Rhetoric. Woo -woo. Yes, I didn't know that was a thing until I met Dan. But one of the things he, he focuses on, and I'm taking his class, so he's got a, a rhetoric class, rhetoric warriors. What's Tell people where they can go find the class and more information. Rhetoricwarriors.com. Uh, I have two courses up now. We just launched... My uh, second course, which is converting conservatives. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't been successful. I told somebody today that no, when it was it yesterday, I said, uh, I said, Dan would continuously message me throughout the election season with like random bits. And I said, I think he was trying out his material on me. I think I was like a guinea pig. Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes it's just fun to just send people things. Like I offered you, uh, offered you a slushy, I think was first, if you would vote for Joe Biden. Correct. And then yep. I upped the game to a slushy and a corn dog. Yes. And I do I mean, love, I do love Sonic. I don't know. Those are good offers. Those are strong offers. I, you know, I would do a lot for a raspberry limeade slushy with nerds in it from Sonic. I'm just saying I would do a lot. Wow, you I didn't know that was yeah, I didn't know that was a thing. Nerd. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I didn't know that was a thing either until somebody told me and it's changed my life. Okay, well then that's my next offer. I'll convert conservatives with uh nerd filled slushies. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things um that I think is so important about what you do is helping teach people 
you know, the fundamentals of why, what the argument is and why they argue for it. And, and what I'm trying, oh my God, now my brain is going to be, um, I'm going to have brain farts. So why don't you just start, Dan, by telling everybody, you know, what are the fundamentals of rhetoric and why do you think that it's so important to study? Yeah, that's a good place. So I'll do it real quick. Rhetoric is just at its foundation is just the study of effective effectiveness and messaging. That's literally the definition that anytime you go to talk, if you're going to be rhetorical, you think about what you're going to say, you design it and construct it, and then you say it to maximize your chances for being successful. And it doesn't matter. A lot of people, when they hear rhetoric, the only time rhetoric makes it into the public consciousness or the media when it's negative rhetoric, like it's empty rhetoric or it's just political rhetoric, you know, you hear that kind of side of it. And that's a small part of rhetoric. That's negative rhetoric. But rhetoric itself is everything that you say when you're trying to persuade or have effects on people. So it's it's literally the study of the best ways that we can talk. And is that, I mean, that really depends a lot on who you're talking to, right? So it's you can't just use the same argument for or against something with the same people. Is that right? Yeah, I couldn't offer slushies to diabetics. That would be awful. <laughs> no, that would be terrible. To, Don't do that. You have to adjust to your audience. That's one of the principles of rhetoric. It's that when you know when you talk to a toddler, you change the way you speak. Like everybody naturally understands rhetoric. They naturally adjust to try to make themselves more successful. So when you talk to a little kid, you know, oh, I've got to adjust my messaging, change my tone of voice, the way I stand, my facial expressions, all that stuff. But it's the same way when you talk to adults, you know, if you're going to be rhetorical, you adjust to the person that you're talking to. So what do you think then, Dan, about how, you know, I, I titled this program, uh, can't we all just get along the persuasion war? And so when you look at the, the way that people are messaging and let's, we don't even have to pick Donald Trump and Joe Biden and that election. We could pick just politics generally. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the tenor of the conversation is really tuned up and people are just automatically ready to get into an argument. How ineffective is it when we all just kind of walk around and start from this place of we're enemies? Well, opposition, you know, used to not exactly mean enemy, right? Opposition meant we had different perspectives, but there was some middle ground to get in there and talk. And, you know, American democracy, especially at the government level and national level, is built on the concept of compromise. So we keep trading off power, you know, mm. Democrats are in power, Republicans are in power. But when those trades happen, there's still middle ground where they do a bunch of work. You know, they, they, they use that sort of space to get the work of government done. And that's changed. Um, it started, I mean, it's been always part, a part of politics, but it became weaponized really strongly in the 80s. Like when Clinton was president and then the neocons came in under Gingrich and they started using policies, you know, and uh, governmental policies and uh, things like what was called principled obstruction. Mm -hmm. So they literally, you know, set the policy of we're not going to agree with anything that Clinton wants, no matter whether it's good for the country or not. We'll block this for a while. And then when we get somebody in power who has more of our values, then we'll allow things to go through. And so when that happens, when you get complete obstruction, people lose their minds. Like, I don't know if you've ever been just told by power, no, you can't do that. Yep. <laughs> but it makes you insane. Yep. You know? And yep. America has always had a middle space where it's not about power. It's about persuasion and compromise. But that is just, it's closed. Well, and it's interesting because it's interesting that you mentioned the 80s, like Newt Gingrich. And I think of, you know, people like Mitch McConnell being in that sort of um, class or I don't know what you would call that, but that like group of people 
isn't that where, definitely in that theory of obstruction when you're in the minority? And that, and it's like, okay, but you guys are also really corrupt. So you're trying to, you're making it look on the outside if nobody's really paying attention, like you're doing something good. And I'm, I'm using these terms really loosely right now. So just, sure, this is not me defending anybody just for the record, but it's like, you guys make it look like you're doing something good, right? Like we like that Mitch McConnell, as an example, was pushing through a lot of conservative judges as a conservative. I really like that. But then you dig into him to find out more and you realize that, you know, he's been part of shipping American jobs overseas and he gives lucrative business contracts to his buddies in China and all this American money is going towards crap that I don't think we should be paying for. And so it's like, this guy's like they care and like they're doing something, but in the background, they're screwing us all over, actually. So what you're saying is po politicians double deal. They don't just yes. stay with one set of values. Correct. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And so it's like, how do we even trust anything that comes out of their mouth or what they're saying? Well, we probably you got to like the cool thing about rhetoric is it gives you a lot of software for making you know some more sophisticated decisions about some of this right nobody ever gets trained in sort of how to kind of think their way through these things how to look at the different things that they're saying and give yourself some space for you know finding a maybe a better way of thinking about it and so like what you did there was like jumping to a full conclusion about well none of them are trustworthy you know, they all, they all, you know, at some point uh, will disregard your values and they'll go against things and they'll lie to you in public. You say, okay, let's all agree that that's true about politics. Now, does that mean they're all corrupt and that you should lose all faith in politicians? Or does it mean you need to understand who they are and why they're that way and adjust? Mm -hmm. So I, what I, one of the things I think I just heard you say was that it's not just important to learn how to persuade, but also to be listening for the way that people persuade. Did yeah, I? A lot of rhetoric is actually counter persuasion. Okay. And it's even de-persuasion, which is the converting conservatives course that I teach. Okay. Like how do you de-persuade somebody who's uh, assumed conservative uh, ideology and conservative rhetoric. And that's like with you, you know, we talked about this, some of my podcast, you know, you went from somebody who was liberal, you know, at one point in your life yeah. and you converted over to conservatism and there are reasons why, and there's a pathway that took you over there. And to me, what's, what I found very interesting is what are those pathways? And if somebody like, I'm not liberal or, or Democrat or a conservative, you know, I, I, I don't do either one of them. I'm not libertarian. I don't do any of those labels. But if I want to bring somebody out of one of those camps, because I think they're either doing something dangerous to themselves or to the country, or I just don't like what they think, then I need mechanisms for doing that ethically, you know, to give you, and the things I, I push are ethical only persuasion techniques, where I can tell you, here's why I think what you, what you believe is, is flawed, and I can do it in a way that doesn't just make you lose your mind so that we can have a conversation. And you can understand my points. You said ethical persuasion. I heard you say ethical, ethical persuasion. Ethical only persuasion. That's the foundation of rhetoric warriors. So it's not about converting people so that you can take advantage of them or things like that. It's about how do we have a conversation to try to come to consensus or to move you off the line. I guess what is, when you say it's only ethical. That's what I push for. It's not, that's rhetoric. A good way to think of rhetoric is like Star Wars. There's the, there's the force and then there's the dark side of the force. I don't know why well, it's not the light side of the force and the dark side, but you know, there's the white arts of rhetoric and then there's the dark arts of rhetoric. And the dark arts, if somebody is using any of those, I won't vote for them and I consider them to be, you know, a flawed public figure. And so part of the goal of rhetoric wars is to teach people to under, to recognize the differences in those and then to go after the people who are doing unethical persuasion in public. 
because it's dangerous. It's dangerous to democracy. It's dangerous to people. We, we lose faith in the way people talk. So like McConnell, kind of what you're talking about, politicians, when they, they say half of what they believe, <laughs> that's unethical. You know, partialism of disclosure is an unethical persuasion technique. And mm -hmm. if somebody's doing it, they should be sanctioned or censored or fined or disqualified something. What did, what did you call that again? Which one? The you partialism. Just, partialism. So I give you I give you half the information or a certain percentage of the information I actually have. That's really interesting. So so we're okay. So I might be going a little bit all over the place, and forgive me if I can try to Good. get um, wonder sort of like targeted. So given that we know that politicians are probably many of them skilled. I'm going to be careful because all or nothing talking is one of those things that I have a tendency, I have a tendency to be hyperbolic and that's not good persuasion. Um, but when we know that politicians maybe are not always truthful when they use this partial, whatever the heck you just called it. Um, how do we make sure as Americans, let's just say, to not buy into the nonsense that politicians are telling us? Because that's, you know, I say I'm a conservative, like I said, but I don't like politicians on either side equally. So this is like not politicians, period. I don't. I really don't. I think that there, I think, I think there are many of them who get into the business. Uh, thinking that they're going to do something good, but are very misguided and have a tendency to believe things that are not so. Um, and so, and then they go out and they tell people these same inaccuracies or things, or they, they convince people, listen to them. And so how do we as constituents listen for those things that are you know, hyperbolic or um, unethical types of persuasion, things that aren't good for coming to consensus and living in community with each other. Well, of course you take courses in rhetoric. You go to rhetoricwarriors.com. Well, you know, you don't take courses from me, but you should, you know, it should be part of our arsenal. Like the Greeks had rhetoric training in their first three trivium courses you had to take rhetoric logic and uh, grammar and until you pass those you couldn't go on and do higher order courses mm -hmm. because it's it's essentially you know logic teaches you how to find true information and then rhetoric teaches you how to communicate it and so when people are speaking in unethical ways you need to be able to identify those ways and counter those ways and it's it's somewhat you know difficult that's a sophisticated way of talking that they've developed over time. And we need more sophistication in order to, you know, call it out and counter it. So, so I do that, think it would be super helpful if people had more training in rhetoric. Do you think that, that some of this has gotten worse over the years because we've taken things out of school that t help teach critical thinking, logical thinking, creativity and stuff like that? Debate. Maybe. I mean, debate's the only kind of baby rhetoric that has survived in the curriculum. You know, and how many people actually do debate? Very few. Um, I think, you know, they gutted the idea of what rhetoric and persuasion is. Like, you don't get taught communication in school, which is crazy because it's the core skill that gets you through life. Relationships, you know, everything, jobs. And we get no formal training in it. We or we just assume everybody will pick it up informally by you know being alive. Uh, and formal classes and that stuff can be really helpful, but they have to be you know well done. Like I never took debate in high school or anything like that. It was boring to me. It looked like playing chess. Yeah, um, we didn't have any. Op I grew up in Podunk, Vermont. Like we didn't have any of those classes at all. None of that was an option. But it's fascinating when you get into it and you see just how, you know, you know, how sophisticated it really is in helping you through life. I mean, just being able to persuade, like take relationships again, be able to persuade your spouse. You have to do that all the time. 
And you can either do it well or you can go to war with each other and do it horribly. Benjamin what do you want? <laughs> literally says all of the time, he says, people will act out of outside of their own best interest or their own self-interest all of the time. Like people don't stop to think, oh, I'm being emotional or I'm being angry and I'm going to alienate this person or, you know, I'm just, I'm mad. So I'm going to blow up this thing that I'm trying to do because they're, because of feelings basically. Yeah. And, you know, men are, you know, famous for being rational persuaders, rational communicators. Like they'll come back to it all the time. Like, you know, well, this and this and this and this and the logical flow of everything. It's like, great. That's awesome that you can do that. You know, that's about a third or a quarter of what we need here mm. in order to actually, you know, do anything. And really good rhetoric isn't just logic. It has to be designed as emotional. And the conversion course that I teach is basically I have a three-step process and it works. It doesn't necessarily, it's not about conservatives. It's about learning how to convert somebody when it's important to you. And so like you do discovery with people this is a normal interpersonal relationship structure. You learn about them, you listen, and then, you know, you create a relationship with them that they get to where they start to trust you. You validate them. They understand, you understand each other some, and then they might let you try to persuade them, but everybody jumps right to persuasion and nobody wants to hear that from people they don't know. Well, that's what, that's what I, so that's what I was listening to you describe that. And I'm like, okay, well, that's something I can do with you know, people I'm in relationship with or that I know, but when it's, you know, maybe if you're a candidate for office or if you're uh, running a nonprofit, how, like, can you get there? Is there, you're going to hate me for asking this, but is there any kind of a shortcut when you don't have the time to develop that kind of rapport with someone? Yeah, actually there's some really good ones. If you, a lot of the stuff too, I blend Hollywood and rhetoric because, you know, I was a late night writer and producer in Hollywood and I've done stand up forever and I understand kind of the flows of entertainment and public performance and really great politicians understand that too. So Bill Clinton's a great example. And there's this thing of, think of it this uh, as the public private. So in private, you know, we act a certain way and we have certain skills and we know how to comport ourselves in private. Yeah. And we go into public and everybody freezes up and they don't act like who they really are. And they, and they act stiffer and they act more formal, mm -hmm. more dramatic, more serious. And Clinton, Bill Clinton was a great example of somebody who was incredibly intimate and personal when he talked in public. And so it creates this sense of having a relationship with him. Mm. So, so authenticity basically is really important. Well, it's just being able to communicate to strangers as if they were close friends of yours. And mm -hmm. this is a Hollywood skill. Like you can't live, you can't survive in Hollywood unless you create instant intimacy with people you don't know. Well, and I think my, I remember having this conversation actually with my pastor and I don't remember exactly what the context of the conversation was, but he said, Erica, the thing that you don't understand is you walk around life without a mask on. Like you show up to situations and you show up to things and you're just you, mm -hmm. but most people actually go out into the world wearing a mask. And that's what it makes me think about when you say, you know, people are either, you know, they think they got to be this way or that way or whatever. And so it almost seems like we're not even like, no matter how normal you might try to be, the other people are coming to the conversation with some kind of a, a shield, if you will, or some kind of a protective measure. Sure. And they should. People are dangerous. <laughs> you know, and your job as a public performer or public persuader is to pierce that shield instantly. And it, you do you want some consulting? Do you want some uh, persona consulting? Yeah. On, on you as a politician? Because I watched some of your videos. Is that a thing you can do? Oh, absolutely. Every, mm -hmm. uh, every, public performer or public person who can make a lot of money or get a lot of power has consultants. I'll tell you a great example of this. Do you know Ron White? 
the blue collar tour comedian. Yeah. You know, super famous guy. Now I worked with him as just a regular stand up multiple times way back in the nineties, you know, and then, uh, he, back then he wore a cowboy hat and a bolero tie and cowboy boots. And he was a cowboy comic. He's from Houston. And he just talked about that and he was a great comic, but he, um, uh, his manager brought in a consultant an image consultant and they remade him basically as a lounge singer. They took away the hat and all the cowboy stuff, gave him a different hairstyle, gave him a jacket, holding a glass of whiskey and a cigar, which is traditional lounge singer uh, persona. He now, he went from a $1,500 a week, a week comedian to like 125 grand per show comedian. Just with that? It's the same material a lot of times. It's just now he's got a super, you know, developed, super strong persona that was designed to carry him where he wanted to get to be. He would never have gotten there as a cowboy comic. That's really interesting. Because one of the things I have talked to Benjamin about a lot and other folks that have supported me is it's like, I feel like there is, uh, like I'm the angry lady, you mm -hmm. know? And I remember Bet Mino being one time when I went to speak at a police commission meeting, he was like, just don't be the angry white lady. <laughs> 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 and I was like, bro, I am angry. And, and, and it is, it's like, and I'm guilty of this. Like I'm, I'm laying all my cards out because I'm no different than anybody else in how to figure out and struggling with this stuff. It's why I'm taking your course um, and why I'm really excited about it because it is hard to not be angry sometimes. And, and like, uh, you know, how do you develop a poker face when, you know, I didn't, I mean, like you said, I used to be a liberal, right? And so I don't generally think people are bad or stupid or evil. I think that they're misguided. But when I go into situations and I'm treated like I'm evil because of what I believe, it's hard not to react to that or to put up my own sort of mask and be like, okay, well, fine. Then I'm going to be the angry white lady because you're freaking mean to me. <laughs> yeah, but you're a professional persuader. So a rhetorician, and I believe very much in authenticity. I believe it as a rhetorical technique. And I also believe it as a moral stance in the world. Mm. I think people should be authentically who they are. You know, I think if you want to get into public, you know, you need to have control over which part of yourself that you're going to display at which times, you know, that's what makes you a professional. Absolutely. That, that's what makes you a rhetorician or a performer or a politician is you have control. And, you know, again, on the unethical side, that becomes a total mask and total fake and totally unreal. But I, I, I disagree with that. I think it needs to be done ethically. So with you, you know, ethically, one of the, one of the tenets of ethics is that you are authentic. If you feel something, you demonstrate it. You don't try to hide it or fake it. So you are authentically angry. <laughs> <laughs> Just be with that. Well, you know, there are techniques that help you own that. That like the problem I think a lot of times is that you're you're being judged not on you. You're being judged on other uh, things that people see as villainous around you. So as soon as you start talking in a certain way or using certain language, then they're going to import all this experience from other people and other situations. And they're just going to dump it all on you. Yep. And it doesn't really apply to you because you're a unique person with unique views on these things, but it's going to happen. So it's just a quick, easy way to judge all the time. It happens yeah. all of the time. If you are, I mean, I had people who would email me during the campaign as an example, and they'd be like, well, if you support Donald Trump, screw you and like all this stuff. And if you say you're or if you just have an R behind your name, I mean, I had a guy in the parking lot of Lowe's and Susan, bless her heart. One of my running mates was like, hey, we're running for office as somebody was walking by. And I was like, Ugh. I mean, <laughs> dude, shut up. And um, bless her heart. She's awesome. I love Susan. But 
that this guy was like, oh, are you Democrats or Republicans? And we were like, we're Republicans. And he's like, screw you. And it's like, dude, really? Well, what did you what did you respond with? Did you respond with anger or like outrage or shock or humor? Um, humor and um and authentic a, humor. It was a little, I was like, oh, look at you and your tolerance. Thanks. No, Bless that's not humor. That's a script. <laughs> like you can't, you can't accuse wow. the uh, the left of being intolerant. That drives them nuts. But that's the thing: is they are like Burlington voters, Chinon County bo voters are discriminatory. They're prejudiced. Well, they're evaluative for sure. They and they are prejudiced. Like there's a clean and clear judgment about the right that you're yeah. villains. And so that, how is that not discriminatory? Uh, is it true? No. Wait. You said McConnell was a villain. He's on the right. What's that? You just said McConnell was a villain. He's on the right. Yeah, but that's Mitch McConnell. That's not me. Yeah, but they don't see you, baby. They see Mitch McConnell. That's not fair, though. How is that not discriminatory? How is how fair is come into it? It has nothing to do with it. You okay, so make real quick evaluations. Okay, right? well, hold on, hold on. Okay. okay, hold on though. Back up. Okay, so I said it's discriminatory. You said it's not. Then you called it evaluative. That did I say eval eva whatever word you evaluative. said? Yeah. yeah. Evaluative. Oh, I said it right. And then I said it's prejudice, and you said yes, it's prejudice. Which that all those three words sound the same to me. Well, they're very, well, they're very yeah, they're very, very close. close. Like when okay. we start playing word, word games, games, we're gonna. We're gonna I think I'm getting feedback in your, am I coming across in your speaker? I can hear you fine. I can't, I, it, so, it sounds like I can hear me talking on your speaker, but maybe not. Oh, hold on. Let me turn it down. Can anybody else hear it um, echoing? Text message me in the chat box. I just didn't want to drive anybody crazy with audio issues. I can't tell. Hopefully somebody will tell us. Okay. I'll let you know if I can hear, if I hear it again. There was an echo, but it went away. Okay. Yeah. I think when you lowered the volume, it got better. Okay. So those words are all close, right? Some of them are, are harsher than others. Yeah. Like evaluative, you know, is judgmental, prejudice, all these, those are all demon words. They're all demonizing words, right? So as soon as you tell me I'm discriminatory, I'm going to import all this oh, other stuff in there, there about like race. race. Because, because that's, that's the area. The area. Yeah, I yeah, can hear myself again. again. Dang it. Am I coming through, through your headphones, headphones or? I don't have you on headphones. I have you on a speaker. Dang it. If I have to plug in headphones, we might have some more audio issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll try it again. Um, let me. Let me see. I'm going to give it a shot. I'm going to take a chance. Can you hear me now? Remember that guy? Can you hear me now, guy? God, he got irritating. He can only make like 50 commercials before everybody wants to push you off a cliff. Flow from Progressive. Are you listening to me? Although she's done pretty well. She's not too irritating. But that guy from uh, Can You Hear Me Now, I always wanted to just choke him and say, can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm just going to do comedy while you're doing <laughs> your audio issues. Can you hear me now? How about now? <laughs> uh, yeah, you've gone away. I can't hear you at all. Okay, I'm, I was muted. How can can you hear me now? I can hear you now. You can hear me. I can hear you. All right. I'm going to unplug speakers all together. Can y'all hear us? Murder comedy? What? Murder comedy. Yeah, it was it was murder comedy. How do you beat that? What? Make That's what Mina. Huh? What is Mina just posted that comment. What does that even mean? Murder did, comedy. Mina? Yeah. I just did a joke about the uh, can you hear, hear me now, guy? Oh, so joke him and say, Can you hear me now? Oh, okay, can you hear me now? Oh, my god, 
Okay, yeah. hopefully that's better. That actually probably is better now too, because then I can better hear Jeff if he's talking in my ear. Yeah, he says no echo. So okay, Ben cool. gets a thumbs up. Ben thumbs. Yes. Okay. So, oh, that's weird. I can hear myself coming through the microphone too. That's a trip. <laughs> okay, we're good. We're good. All right, we're with you, people. Good. By the way, if you guys have any questions for uh, Dan, feel free to just post it in the chat box. Yeah. We'll read it and ask and let him know what it is and get him to answer. So we were getting on a good topic. Now I don't remember. I have to remember what we were. So what I was saying oh, is discrimination. That, that lexicon, that vocabulary is problematic. And as soon as you mm. say you're discriminating against me, race typically owns the word discrimination. Mm. So because I was saying. intentionally poking people when they'd be like oh blah 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 and i'd be like well then you're just then you're prejudiced oh yeah, what I do you mean i'm like that. i would advise okay. you against using that okay it's going to cause you more problems than you want i just really wanted people to understand that that's what they were doing it's not the same thing like discrimination the the technical definition of discrimination yes that's exactly what it is but that's not the cultural use of the word discrimination. But it's also the same. But prejudice is the same thing. It's not. That's what I was saying. Like every since, especially, you know, with the civil rights movement uh, and the black community basically owns discrimination. That's not fair. That is not fair. That means that black people own fair. words. Gay they, people they own the rainbow. It. This they is not fair. That word. It was, it's been a long, a long fight. And so you, can, you as a white person, can't appropriate that term without getting some <laughs> real blowback. So if I use, if I get out my thesaurus and I use a different word that means the same thing, does that work? Absolutely. Words inflame people. That's why you mm. find neutral words that don't inflame people. So they'll actually listen to you. Okay. As as so you prejudice and discriminate discrimination. You've lost white lady. They're not going to listen to you. See, that's great. Like, so this is the kind of thing, and I know we've talked about this before, where you say, you know, you can't just use the same terms that everybody uses. Like, you know, there's a lot of times I would get really frustrated listening to other conservatives that were running for office give their answers at candidate forums, as an example, because they would say things like, um, <laughs> Oh, you know, personal responsibility. I'm trying to think of an, a specific example, but I'm just like, oh my God, you just said the same thing that every old white man always says that everybody gets mad about that nobody wants to hear. Because you're talking to other conservatives. You're not talking to the moderate middle that you're trying to win. Yeah. So like if you're going to be sophisticated, like if you're going to be professional and work hard to give people good messaging that they can, you know, that, that can actually move them towards where you want them to be, then you adjust. And you're like, I need to be more sophisticated in my script here mm. because I'm inflaming people in ways that I don't want, you know, to have. And so like the right has a problem with this in general that they tend to do a lot of appropriation of other, other rhetorics, mm. other terms and things like that. And it gets them into trouble because it's not, they're they haven't earned those terms you know yeah like for white people right now to say i'm being discriminated against they have not earned that term hold on one second there is a sign on the door that says do not disturb huh. i don't care what you want do, thank you but i was disturbed So, Benjamin, you know, don't go Benjamin, no when problem. are we? Don't go stealing people's words. Oh my god. Trouble. Um, I I, I apologize. Words. The multiple knocks, I couldn't be undistracted anymore. So, um, so conservatives have a tendency to appropriate other things, and that's and and so we suck at it. No, you don't suck at it. It's just that that appropriation is going to cause rhetorical problems. So when can you get, so you gave me an example, like don't say discriminate, don't say prejudice or whatever, right? Is there other specific examples of things that you could highlight or like, or like general uh, groups of things that people should be careful to avoid? Well, just like that one, if you use the word unfair, you'll probably be fine. And people will be like, then they'll think, am I being? I'm, I'm so sorry, Dan. Hold on.
Should I do more comedy? More murder comedy? I don't know how many murder jokes I have. <laughs> I Maybe I tell some more murder jokes and kill. <laughs> right? I don't want dead space. Entertainers never want dead space. No, they don't. And boy, this has just been a really challenging episode. Hey, you were all up on yourself at the beginning about how tech star you were. Benjamin, this is evidence that we need to hurry up and move. <laughs> we were just talking earlier about how having roommates is really annoying sometimes. <laughs> um, so anyway, anyway, here we are. Here we are. So yeah. So like use the word, did you get that last piece of advice that if you use the word unfair? Yeah, that seems okay. like, uh, that seems like not a good word to use. Why? Nobody owns unfair. Unfair, but because, you know, people say, well, life isn't fair, you know? It's still a good indictment of people. So if, oh, if, like, okay. well, if you say, hey, you know, I'm applying for this job and I don't get, you know, as much consideration because I'm white and I think that's unfair interesting so benjamin has a question mm -hmm. and he says is there a difference between general sales technique techniques and dan's concepts of persuasion did you see my response that i typed to him oh i'm way better <laughs> okay well maybe you can uh maybe you can elaborate a little bit more. no no that's it that's I'm way better. Three word response. <laughs> Get your weak sales techniques out my face. Really? You're not going to answer him? What's it? Well, I'm not talking about sales right now. I'm talking about, you know, no, like what's, and, so what's the difference politics. between sales and persuasion? So rhetoric wasn't taught for a long time. And it kind of made it back into universities through business schools with advertising and marketing and sales. And so that's kind of, you know, business needs persuasion, needs it really badly. And so they've developed a lot of their own ideas about persuasion. Usually it's not, you know, it's fine. There's some really <clears throat> good things about sales if that's what you want to learn. But it's specific to business and it's not really specific to humanity or to mm. politics and the things that I do. And I've sense. worked a lot in business in the last five years doing marketing. So I've learned a lot of, you know, what needs to be done in sales. And my partner, my marketing agency is a sales guy. So I've heard lots and lots of that stuff. Um, I, t I think typically it needs to be thought through better that they would, you know, rhetoric's been studied for 2,500 years, sales for like, you know, a hundred. Five and minutes. Yeah. They could, they could benefit from, you know, some deeper theory. So how do you maneuver like, is there a way to identify those verbal landmines or those language, linguistic yeah, landmines? Watch how people respond. <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there no way to know ahead of time? Well, you know, you do, uh, you do enough of those things and that's, you know, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. When you do enough of those things, that's why, you know, experienced politicians, by the time they get to national level, they're usually so good because they've done so much of that, that nothing surprises them. They know all the landmines and they all know they know all the good triggers, too. Mm -hmm. So the right and the left have good trigger words that as mm -hmm. soon as you say them, then you get good response from people. Yep. You know, and so part of becoming a national politician a really you know, highly uh, skilled <clears throat> politician is to, to learn all those words and to get very good at using them and not using them, you know, depending on where you're at. So is it just a matter of like, I just think, you know, most people are not thoughtful with their word choice. They just say whatever comes to their it's mind. Expressive. They just yeah, say things. Most people do their communication as expressives that they, they don't know what they're going to say until it comes out of their mouth. Yeah. That's not a rhetorician. <laughs> so then I'm just trying to think of like, how does a person plan ahead to be able to have conversations 
that, I mean, maybe, maybe that's too much to ask. Maybe it's too much to say, oh, you can totally plan ahead to figure out, oh, just remove these 15 words from your language. Or, you know, if you're talking to a black person, these are things you should never say. Or like, I mean, is that just like practice and developing that stuff over time? Well, it depends on, again, like, you know, what, what game you're playing, what mm. field you're in. You know, if you're going across many different populations very quickly and some of them you don't have experience with, then you can only prepare so much. You can only get so much experience. I did stand up once for 200 uh, Japanese teenagers who were in the United States doing, you know, a tour with a, a, a tour company and they bust them into the Hollywood improv and we had to do stand up for them. I had to do 10 minutes in front of 200 Japanese teenagers. And they didn't speak English, you know, some of them, or it wasn't their first language. Right. And so, and they didn't understand the culture. Cultural, like, nuances or jokes or people or history. You know, and they're, and they're teenagers. And they were horrified by anything, <laughs> you know. <laughs> they were like, what's going on? And they gave them cake. And, you know, <laughs> I, and I'm like, what am I supposed to do here? You know, I could not adjust to that audience. That's too far too fast. Mm. if I had taken a lot of time and understood them and learned what they think is funny and all that, then I could have made messaging, you know, that would have fit them better. But, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of those audiences. Well, and that makes me think about like, um, you know, a lot of, as an example, a lot of the conservatives that I see running for office, you know, we're in a very liberal area. I mean, we are in a mega wicked, hyper liberal place in Vermont. And if you are not prepared to have those conversations with people and you haven't taken a moment to stop and consider who your audience is, I think a lot of times it's like people don't consider who their audience is. I think that's really a big part of it. That's a more sophisticated way of doing rhetoric, of mm. really thinking about your audience and pre-working so that you're ready, you know, with more script. And, you know, that's not a lot of people when they get into public jobs like even as politicians it's not their full-time job they don't have training in, in it they have some strong views but they don't have the communication training you know to communicate those views into complicated populations and so you're going to make mistakes and you know when you do consulting and i do training with people who want to do public type communication there are things that you teach them which is you know don't try to do too much too fast Start with something small that you've got control over and then move out from there. National politicians handle it with talking points. George Bush was, you know, great at this. He had a, a stump speech, a set of stump speeches, set of talking points. He learned them and he delivered them mm. over and over, no matter what. And that's a safety net. Mm. It's pre-designed by professional writers. You've practiced it so you know how to deliver it. It kind of annoys people in the moment that they're being given, you know, pre-written script. Right. It's, I've heard you say this line 20 times before. Yeah, but it's still a great line and it doesn't get you into trouble, trouble. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not a good improviser and Bush wasn't, you know, he was too much of a gunslinger. He, he liked to joke, you know, and that's a bad thing for a politician <laughs> because jokes you know, step on, uh, you know, social mores and taboos and shock. And that's what they do. Bad for politicians. Which is what, okay, that doesn't, okay. <clears throat> yes, but why? Like people say all of the time that they want people to be more authentic, that they want someone who will say the truth and be more plain uh, speak more plain English or, you know, whatever, fill in the blank. And yet then when it, when somebody comes out, that's like that, it's a problem and we don't like it. People are too polished and that's a problem. Well, I think, you know, polish is something that bothers Americans. We like to see the real person. And if it's polished, we assume we are not getting the real person. I watched this happen with Pete Buttigieg, who I thought was very authentic at the beginning of his exposure from he was a mayor and suddenly he's on national TV and he over talked a lot and told a lot of, you know, 
really interesting details and I, I, I like the guy. And then when he went on debate stages and stuff, he'd clearly gotten some training. He sounded like Obama. He literally used the Obama speech delivery pattern. The cadence debate. and everything. Yep. Everything. He used the national cadence. I'm so annoying. That, that may be good. I don't know. Like getting him elected, that may be good. But it alienated me. And then after all that, he he's come back now. And like I watched him at some of his uh, the hearings for transportation secretary. And he's back to sort of talking authentically. And he's very good spontaneously. Mm. You know, his his responses sound authentic and thoughtful. And he's not trying to be mean. But he also doesn't take anything from people. So it's interesting to to see that difference of dialogue, authentic dialogue in the moment and prepared when script. When you say he doesn't take anything from anyone, do you mean the speech pattern or what did you mean by that? Oh, I mean, content wise, like both sides play this game of, mm. you know, I need to catch you in something wrong. I need to stain you and slander you in some way during this interaction. <laughs> You know, so they both they do it to each other where they focus on the negative things about that person. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether they're accurate or not. They're trying to focus on that because that's where they win is by lowering their opponent whenever mm. they can. It's an that, unethical technique, but it's clearly, you know, a popular one. That is really uh, a good point. And I I was noticing this recently you know if your whole pitch is the other guy sucks and i don't suck as bad as the other guy i feel like that's a pretty bad pitch it's like know, it, seems, it seems to work i mean the right um and trump was you know a master of this uh, of insults insults and staining you know finding something negative like this week they came out with oh joe biden's got a rolex I was like, okay, all right. So I guess like he's got a million, you know, billion dollars at home and he jumps in it like Scrooge McDuck. I don't. Well, hold on. Biden's whole pitch was I'm not Trump. Like, come on. It, that goes both ways. Well, actually it doesn't. Like those are not, those are completely un false equivalencies. A guy with a Rolex on his watch and a guy who has a gold toilet. <laughs> oh, I'm not, <laughs> not talking about that. Thing. I'm saying like Donald Trump being rude and like him being like, oh, Hillary's of this and, you know, whatever, and insulting people like that was also Biden's whole pitch. So Trump's pitch in 2016, and I'm speaking specifically just about election season, was Hillary sucks. She's corrupt. She's a twat. And can I say that? I don't think I'm allowed to say that word. We might have to bleep this out later. But, uh, you know, she's a this and that and whatever. Vote for me. Right. That was his whole pitch. And now this election season, Biden was like, Trump sucks and is a crazy person. Vote for me. I think like, isn't that um, the same? Well, it's the same impulse. Yeah. I mean, you want to say negative things about your opponent. Okay. Got it. So why does that work? Because you can only do two things in, you know, political rhetoric. You can either raise yourself up and make yourself, you know, more heroic or you can lower the other side and make them more of a villain. That's and one's really easier. Do. Is it like one is just easier than the other and that's why they stoop to that? No, they do both all the time. Hmm. Trump was a great boaster. You know, that guy could boast. You know, I'm the greatest like president. Like a champion. And more, you know, I'm a stable genius. You know, <laughs> it, it's endless, like. He, he comes from a promotional background where you can make massive overclaims and it's fine. And he imported that into politics and, you know, but it's all sort of the same impulse, which is to build yourself up, build your side up and to tear the other side down. Those are the two major forces in, in political rhetoric. In, in traditional Greek, it's called epideictic rhetoric. It's praise and blame. So, you praise your side. There's a great example of this from Shakespeare. Of uh, Mark Anthony comes up and pray, says, I'm not here to praise Caesar, but to bury him. And then proceeds to praise Caesar for an hour and, <laughs> and to tear down all the guys who stabbed him. And epideictic rhetoric is just, can I make praise stick on the heroes 
and can I make blame stick on the villains? So then, okay, so let's, so I want to bring this back to local politics and conversations within family. my perspective on Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> no, well, I mean, there for a while. Yeah, but no, shut up. It's not the same place. Um, Coat Factory? I think the Coat Factory is in like Connecticut or something. Burlington, Connecticut. That's just mislabeled unethical rhetoric right there. I'm just, I mean, Connecticut, we could lose as a state and I'd be fine with that. Really? What's wrong? I shouldn't say that. I shouldn't say that. That's rude. I don't really mean that. I'm only saying that. Well, I have a few reasons to say that. One is they are the only state in the union that has not at least started the process toward uh, passing the Convention of States application. So 49 out of 50 states have at least uh, ha- at least have some movement on the Convention of States resolution, except so Connecticut. Poor Connecticut. Come on. What's that? So you're going to go after poor little Connecticut? Poor little Connecticut? Are you kidding me? They're, they have some of the wealthiest people in the country. I don't feel bad for Connecticut because they're not supporting your cause screw connecticut no i'm just kidding i don't really mean that i don't really know anything about connecticut Connecticut? to be honest with you erica bundy rhetoric you you could come after her but you can't spell any of her names um no but seriously um oh and connecticut is bankrupt apparently that's another reason to not like connecticut (laughs) this is all right vermont stole all their money Oh my God, don't oh, even get me started. Um, so, so how can we, so is it like, it? I can't tell if it's national politics has brought the conversation down into the gutter in our neighborhoods and with our families, or if it started in our families and is, is do you know what I mean? Like, is there a correlative relationship or a causative relationship or is it just back to that same conversation, which is we don't know how to talk to each other? Well, we haven't been taught how to do political discussions. Like, did you ever take a course and, Hey, here's how to talk to your family about politics. Again, Mm -hmm. nobody has any argument training or my family period, you know? Yeah. Well, across the board, there is so much, more to the point, I would say it's been the opposite of that in that so much of the self-help culture and our self-centered culture is it's about you and what makes you happy. And you are the center of the universe and your truth and your beliefs and your whatever. And that if people don't agree with you, well, then you should just cut them out of your life. I feel like that's actually more what's encouraged rather than trying to dwell in understanding of the people in your family. Yeah, I think that's a good that little line that you just said, which I think is a Christian line, dwell in understanding. Um, you know, good religions and religions are working correctly. They give you those little life instructions like that, which are incredibly powerful if you practice them. Mm. So to dwell in understanding means to sit in non-judgment, to let people say whatever they want to say, you know, and to, like we talked about, you know, the technique of validating it, validating (sighs) them, their right to say it, their value as a person, and be able to take that. And that's hard for people. Well, and that's, oh, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you. That Uh is validating and valuing, I think is so important because it's like, So many people that I talk to, it's their, their opinions or their political beliefs or whatever are like who they are as a person. It's almost like if you disagree with their opinion on politics or you attack their position, attack, that's maybe not the great, question their position, excuse me, it's like you're attacking them as a human being and saying that they are something like garbage or whatever. Yeah, well, people's political beliefs, hopefully, and their social issue beliefs grow out of, you know, their core identity, Mm. who they are. So it is attacking who they are. 
you know, it's, it's going after for you, it's going after an issue or a logic, you know, or a, an expressed delete, uh, belief and it's external, but for them, they hold these things inside of them. And so when you are criticized about those things, it is personal the same way it's personal to you when you've got, you know, you've told me stories about being treated badly because you were Christian or because you're conservative, especially when you're in California and that hurts, you know, cause it feels like a personal judgment because it is to you. That's true. But I've also had to, well, and so, okay, so this is interesting. I've also had to come to terms with the fact that people's opinions of me or opinions of my opinions don't matter. And that, that is not like people not liking my politics does not decrease my value as a human being. All right. But you've trained to that. You've been in politics. You've had a lot of experience with it. You've been and a lot like, of therapy hey, to... and a lot of Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and that, you know, I've got to get to a healthier place for this. Cause I, and therapists learn this, like you can't absorb the emotion in every interaction mm. or you'll, you'll explode. And so public, the same thing, like you learn to just, it doesn't, you don't have any feeling from it. You let it go instantly. You're like, this isn't real. They don't know me. You know, all those things that teach you, you know, again, how to be a public rhetorician, which are skills that you need if you're going to do politics and you need them in your private life. It turns out too, when you want to talk about politics over, you know, Thanksgiving dinner, but people don't have them. They're well, just raw. And so they just erupt. It sounds like it, I feel like a lot of these conversations end up coming back around to people need to deal with their mental health issues. And I'm and I'm putting that I'm using a broad term there, but like so much of what I feel like is. Is a challenge in society right now or in communication and relationships is people not understanding that their value comes outside of themselves. Like it's not about, you know, it's like, doesn't matter. Like what people think about you is not where your value comes from. Your opinions are not where your value comes from. Um, how do you not take things personally that people say to you? Uh, it's almost like our emotional issues get in the way of us being able to be present in the conversation. It's like we make the conversation mean more than what it actually means. Yeah. And again, you know, cycle back to the fact that you've had, you know, training and experience in, you know, psych health and things like that. It's been part of your life so that you've developed some real insight into it, mm -hmm. you know, some depth of experience. Most people, again, don't have that. You know, like my, my daughter, my, my ex-wife is a therapist. And so my kids have all sorts of psych talk training. <laughs> and my daughter made a t-shirt when she was in the art program in high school. It said, my mom's a therapist. Uh, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and, you know, it's because they've had that training and it's done them. It's, it's helped them a lot of ways, you know, when they get into complicated emotional situations, because they have, you know, some terminology for it and somebody yeah. to talk to and process it. And so, again, I, I can't help the fact that, like, I was a professor for 20 years and I just know the super value of real education. And I see people trying to work through these very difficult discussions about politics with no training yeah. and then wonder why we can't talk. I'm like, well, because you haven't been trained to and you're in a complicated, explosive situation. Well, and that's the so that the idea of validating and valuation, I feel it seems like that would go a really long way to building that rapport that you talked about, where if I'm having a conversation, even if it's with somebody that I don't know super well, or don't have a deep relationship with, if I can keep that in mind, that this is a person who is inexperienced in rhetoric, and likely uh, puts a lot of weight and uh, and story behind what they believe, what it means, you know? And so if I can let them know, like, it's not even just enough to say, like, I hear you or parroting back what they say to that you heard them. It's 
showing them that you're seeing them as a human being, even if you disagree with them, basically. Yeah, I think that's a great technique. That's, that's really valuable. And if you, if you bring that, you won't be angry white lady. <laughs> I'm going to practice that. Well, you'll be accepting I, white lady who still has some issues that bother her. <laughs> and people will give you space to do that. You know, I think you earn that by giving, you know, that kind of listening and that kind of space and that kind of respect to people. You show that to them and then you earn the right to say some of your views. Hmm. You know, whatever they are, it doesn't matter. So what do you do if you're in a place that is just like, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you say. You're just in an area where people treat you really unfairly, no matter what, right off the bat. Like, is there a way, I mean, are there some times as a professional rhetorician, did I say that right? Yeah, rhetorician? everybody says rhetorician, but it's rhetorician. No, rhetorician. Um, a rhetorician. Is there ha, is there ever a time where it just doesn't matter what you do, there's no way to get through to some people or some person? Well, sure. I mean, failure is, you know, way more common in persuasion than success. You know, I, I tell people to chop it up. Like if there are 500 mm. things that could be accomplished here yeah, and you get three, then you, that's a victory. I can't <laughs> take somebody that I just meet from a belief system that they've had for 50 years, you know, over to a new belief system, mm. but I can make them think, you know, I was already talking to that liberal, you know, <laughs> and that's a victory. And I'm not even a liberal, like, you know, to me, it's like one of the things I do is with comedians because comedy is just a different approach or, you know, intellectual uh, professor on the other side is, you know, it's one of those things that people, they, it bothers them sometimes when you come from a position of expertise. Mm. And so uh, sometimes people, because I'm also a super working class. I mean, I came from Kentucky and I was the first person to go to college. And so when they talk to me, and a lot of times they're like, I wasn't that bad talking to that professor guy. <laughs> That's, a That's a super victory in persuasion is because I got something good uh, in them about me. Yeah. So if it was important to me and like the convert converting conservatives class, I make the point that I've got a program called convert one conservative and it could be convert one liberal. I don't care, but I started with conservatives. And so convert one conservative, you know how much energy it takes to actually persuade a human being? No. A lot. And it's <laughs> ugly and it's no fun and it's emotionally uh, wrecking, you know, and you have wow. to listen to a bunch of stuff that you don't agree with in order to get through that mm. and maybe start to convert them to a different way of thinking. Wow. And it's no fun. And so just pick one, one person. Like you, if you want to, you know, you're going to get mistreated when you don't fit within a political culture and you live in that community. Yeah. What I would do if I were you is, so there's the traditional ways of communicating yourself as a conservative, which would probably work just fine if you were in Pearland, Texas, you know? Yeah. But you're not, you're in Vermont. So appropriate a bunch of their stuff. <laughs> Wear a bunch of blue, but with just a tiny little red button. <laughs> red button. Let me talk to you about it. <laughs> well, that's what it's like wild stuff that like, you know, having a flag is freaking racist and having a, this is like, well, if you, you believe the in the constitution, it's flag? race. What's that? I said, you're not, I said this at the, begin, at the beginning of all this, you're not being judged on Erica. You're being yeah. judged on all the stuff they've seen on TV. And there have been a yeah. lot of horrible people running around with Trump flags on TV. That is true. And so you're going to be judged like that. So you don't want to associate yourself with that. You want to explain who you are yeah, and avoid all that ugly judgment. I got a lot of crap for not being openly uh, a Trump supporter. 
during the campaign. Um, you know, I had made some videos that said, you know, I did like I did a video as, as an example. I didn't think Joe Biden could win the Electoral College. I thought that he was going to win the popular vote and not the Electoral College. I thought it was going to be uh, that was my prediction. <clears throat> and I made, you know, some other videos that were similar to that. Um, but people kept asking me, you, you know, you have to tell me if you're voting for Trump or not. And I was like, I'm not going to let you let the Vermont Senate Chittenden County seat be a referendum on Donald Trump. I'm not going to do that. I am an individual human being and I have individual thoughts and opinions. And, you know, yes, I didn't say this to them, but yes, I'm voting for Donald Trump. But there's also a lot of crap about him that I do not like. You know, like uh, he is an imperfect vessel for what's that? Why didn't you say that? Because I didn't want to have the headline be, oh, S Senate candidate is a Trump supporter. Oh, because yes, then, you did. Hell yes, you wanted that. No, I you didn't. All the other Trump supporters who you actually want to represent would have voted for you. They did. Well, then you won. I mean, no. <laughs> Yeah. Because people in Chinon County are too prejudiced to even consider a Republican. I told you not to use that word. I know I said it on purpose. <laughs> um, so we're unfair. about. It's unfair you didn't vote for me. I just, Dan, I just realized it's after eight o'clock. Um, so I normally go for about an hour. Okay. I know we had some technical difficulties. So maybe that's why it went by so fast. Um, no, it's because my stuff is fascinating. It really actually is. It really, really is. And uh, I'm missing a couple of weeks of class. So I'm going to have to email you about that. Oh, they um, sure. Yeah, we had a little glitch at one point, but just, yeah. Did you sign but, up for full class or did you just sign up for the first two free weeks? The full class. Okay. Yeah, I'm super excited. I love it. It's been, it's so fascinating because, and I just, so everybody, if you have some curiosity about this, if you want to run for office, if you just want to be able to have a good conversation at the Thanksgiving dinner table and not scream at your sister's guest and tell them to go F themselves, like I might have done a couple of years ago, <laughs> literally, it was not good. We used to Thanksgiving. Oh, my God. It was so bad. It was before I started all of this process and really learning. And it also happened to just be like my life was really stressful at the time and things kind of sucked. And then this man who is a person who wants to just be an instigator, I let him get under my skin. And that's one of the things is this person didn't even really care about the things that he was saying. He was just being a jerk. Like he was literally trying to make me mad. Americans love that. That's one of their uh, favorite things to do. Oh my God. I just, so that's one of the other things I would say is if you're having a conversation with people and they're being a jerk, like, they, they might be doing it intentionally to upset you. And so if you go with it and you just let them lead the conversation, like you're not in control of your own self. Yeah, you you have the right to de determine who gets to talk to you and how they get to talk to you. That's true. That so is true. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't do trolls. I don't I don't allow any negativity. I don't take any negative feedback. I don't argue with people I don't know. I don't do any of that stuff because it's, it's, you know, it's detrimental. I, I don't enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy talking to people that are thoughtful and interesting and I don't care if they're right or left, but I want to hear their thoughts. I don't want to hear their accusations and their trolling. You know, they, they can do that yeah. on their own. They can say whatever they want, but I'm not required to hear it. <laughs> well, and so does your class help, um, teach people tools. I mean, I've gotten some of it, but if, if when people go through the whole thing, do we learn tools for kind of talking to anybody? Is it, is it, I, obviously you, you said there's one course that you have that's, you know, converting conservatives. And so that maybe directly or, um, you know, sort of tailored in a certain way, but is the other class, like the one I'm taking, is that Am I going to learn how to talk to any kind of group of per people or community or like, will I learn tools for communicating, I guess, is the, is the short answer. Yeah, the master course. So there's two courses. There's the master course in persuasion and there'll be a volume one and probably 
five volumes at some point, but it's 25 weeks. I sell it for 25 bucks because I want people to actually take it. Wow. Like it only costs $25 to take a class from me. Hold on. Okay. Hold on. What? I don't want to do the seven hundred and ninety nine dollar. Yeah, you know, dude. Master. I don't want See, to see. Okay, so now I'm mad that I got the I know Dan discount and it was only twenty five dollars. Man, well, I would have just given you the twenty five to, that, to that, support you. Partner, the sales guy launched it at ninety nine, and I'm like, I don't care about that right now. I care about I want people. To people make- actually doing it. Okay, sorry, I interrupted you. So it's twenty five bucks. All my okay. So is every if everybody is listening, any every one of you that is listening right now. Any of my supporters, any of my friends, any fellow politicians, anybody thinking about it, for $25, you can learn how to go talk to people and not sound like an idiot. Okay? (laughs) It's idiot avoidance training. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. There's no reason to not do this. Okay. I interrupted you. I'm sorry. Please Um, finish. You were talking about tools. That's a master course in persuasion, and basically what I do is I go through, again, the 2,500 year history of studying persuasion. Mm-hmm. And I just pluck out what I know are the best concepts. Mm-hmm. And I write about one each week. And so like, um, I think you may have gotten the one about big signals, um, which is the whole thing with the Capitol, you know, uh, protest and insurrection, depending on whatever terms you want to land on it. They, it's a big signal. Like it started to fade a little because we're getting farther away from it. But it was such a huge, you know, visual, it's such a big spectacle. Yeah. And the colors and the close-ups and the violence and all that, it will never go away. That will be, you could talk about that 20 years from now and people will know what it was. Yeah. And it's so powerful that the right is going to, they're going to suffer from that. Anybody associated with that big signal, that big piece of, you know, rhetorical symbol is going to suffer and you're watching them. They're trying to get away from it. And some of them are still going towards it. I'm like, okay, I can see, you know, I can see a play there <laughs> get where you want to go. But it's so like, that is the idea of like, if you're building <clears throat> national persuasion, yeah. you better get a big signal. You know, you better construct something like that to drive you up like a flare that is so big, like a firework that is so big that everybody sees it. And that's real rhetorical power on a national scale. Yeah. But you can construct that stuff. And that's what rhetoricians do is like, hey, I need this. I may have to take 100 options, 100 tries, but eventually I find something, I design something or whatever that really pops. Yeah. And it changes everything. So the course is, the master course pulls up concepts like that the uh, converting conservatives is more about personal conversion. Yeah. Like when you talk to people one-on-one, you know, and you're trying to bring somebody either out of a political perspective or to a political perspective, how do you do it? And I've had to do some of this with my daughter. She's a millennial, you know, she's 21 and she grew up in Austin and Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So she's as liberal as liberal gets, (laughs) but she goes, she goes romping over into the far side of liberalism that I don't particularly enjoy talking to. Yeah. I'm like, you can't be that reactive because then nobody can talk. You keep taking all the words, you know? And I get that we need to be, you know, expand our vocabulary to not offend some people and understand the value of that. But you can't take all my words. That's why I was like arguing with you about not being able to say prejudice. Yeah, but you stole that word. That ain't your word. Oh, my God. But the, all the words. I, I said I'm going to start a segment on the news program, and I'm going to call it Language Police. This week on light, on the your, on this no, week's episode of Language Police. In trouble. Why? Because you're, again, appropriating for... Oh, my you're, God. You're, even if your concept is correct, you're appropriating things that you don't deserve. Oh, you my God. Earth. Oh my God. Why? What's who's earned language? Who am I appropriating language police from? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't want to get into a new topic, but it's this the same thing. Like that is not, you didn't come up with the idea of language police. You're borrowing that from somebody. Oh my God. Okay. So I have to come up with my, what if I come up with my own name for it? Well, that's what rhetoricians do. You need your own unique way that avoids the negative, amps up the positive, and then you've got some rhetorical energy there. You've done some rhetorical work. Oh my God, 
God, this is so much effort. <laughs> yeah, it turns out talking to public to human beings not easy. Oh my God, every <laughs> because everybody's got something that they're like triggered by or you know is offensive to them. And I'm sorry, so I interrupted you talking about your daughter. Like, what do you do when you're talking to somebody like that? Well, you learn some rhetorical techniques for changing them. I've had to desensitize her because I don't like talking to that. And mm. I've had to adjust to her, you know, I've had to so say it goes yes, both I, ways because she, she does professional makeup. So she's a makeup mm. artist and she works in movies and special effects and with drag queens, you know, and she's been in that community and knows a lot of drag queens and has done makeup for them and really knows the issues of their life and what they go through. And it's mm. important to her. So she has no tolerance for anybody who doesn't have any of that experience and doesn't have a sophisticated language to talk about it. And I'm like, again, if you want to do good things for that community, not tolerating mistakes is a bad idea. You yeah. need to teach people, but not with this sense of indictment and like, how dare you? But more like, okay, well, let me show you something. Wow, that's probably not the right thing to say. Well, and I think that, you know, that is almost bringing us back around and probably a good place to put a pin in it is that reminder that when we insist on seeing the other person as the enemy or bad or wrong or flawed, we don't, we lose the opportunity to persuade them because instead we just condemn them. Yeah, we bash them and nobody is going to be persuaded by bashing. No, I can tell you in all of the arguments that I've gotten in with my husband, screaming at him has never once been effective. Yeah, but it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so rhetoricwarriors.com yep. is the website. Is there any other place people should go to check you out, see what you're doing? Do you have like a, a calendar? Are you doing any stand up these days? What you got going on? Uh, you know, stand up died with the pandemic. Hopefully it'll come back at some point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, Rhetoric Warriors is the main thing I'm doing right now. And it's um, like I tweet jokes all day long at Rhetoric War, political jokes all day long. Uh, I take shots at both sides, but I take a lot of shots at the right because they're easier to take shots at. They uh, make bigger mistakes. Um, and they have bigger characters sometimes, like Cruz and Holly and these guys. I'm like, uh, so easy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if you want to, if you just want jokes, you know, about politics, go to, uh, uh, it's called at rhetoric war. Cause I couldn't get warriors in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Too long. Yeah. Um, I, so I, that's on Twitter I talk about this stuff all day long at rhetoric war and uh, rhetoric okay. warriors. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of my main thing right now. Okay. And then is it the same? Are you on all the social medias, all the social medias? So either at rhetoric war or Dan French. It's all at Rhetoric Warriors now. Okay. So, um, cool. And I am I'm not doing YouTube yet, but I will be, and I'm probably going to be doing a at least a week uh, monthly or maybe a weekly newsletter. So cool, awesome, Dan. Thank you so much for being with us today, this evening, uh, giving people some good information about talking to their grandpa at Thanksgiving and their neighbors. <clears throat> I'm going to have you hold on with me just a second while I end the broadcast and make sure that we don't say anything embarrassing live. So thank you all for visiting. Uh, Generally Irritable, this week's episode. Next week, I'm going to have on Mary Beerworth. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mary Beerworth is the executive director of Vermont Right to Life, and she's going to be talking with me about uh, Vermont's bill to add abortion to our constitution. So that should be a really interesting conversation. So thank you again, Dan, rhetoricwarriors.com. Everybody go check him out. It's $25 to take a lesson in not sounding like an idiot. That's my plug for you, Dan. Thanks. All I right. appreciate that. All right. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Bye.